guys are like, Sean, you sound better without that thing. All right, let's begin in prayer. <coughs> God, we thank you for the scripture reading today. We thank you for these songs, Lord, that and we pray that you receive them, uh, Lord, and they're pleased. God, uh, Holy Spirit, there are things more wonderful than we can uh, comprehend here in your word. Uh, and as you spoke them to Job, Father, uh, speak them to us. Uh, give us the uh, ability to understand and ability to comprehend. I pray, Lord, you purge from our hearts that which is still in the way of us drawing nearer to you and experiencing uh, uh, your, your oneness, your greatness. And so, Father, um, open our eyes this morning. Uh, give us a, a renewed uh, vision for you, for who you are, who we are, and renew energy for our days beginning tomorrow. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Carl, for Bible Bag. Thank you, LaShawn, for, for choosing those songs for us today. So we're in our last lesson through the book of Job. And uh, uh, there, there's a slight reason why I waited till the end of uh, the year to go through Job because I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Suffering is hard to talk about, and uh, but we need to talk about it. And I personally have grown a lot by reflecting again on, on the story of Job and hope you have too. And again, all these lessons can be found uh, on our YouTube page. Uh, Sarah uh, uploads those for us every week, so... Um, all right, so again, the story of Job. Job suffered more uh, m more than, than any of us will ever suffer. Uh, lost all of his children in one day. Lost all of his wealth in one day. Lost all of his health. Uh, lost his health in one day. And, uh, and the worst part of it, we said, was that Job was never told why this happened to him. And so uh, I want to talk about one last thing today that I think we learn uh, as we get toward the very end. And f four things I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how God answers Job. I want to talk about what God answers Job. I want to talk about what God does not answer Job. And I want to talk about what's the answer. Okay. So let's talk about how God answers Job. A an argument that is... Uh, often a response to suffering in the world. Many people, many people say, if God really loved his children, he would not allow them to suffer at all. In fact, one bitter wife said to her husband uh, once, if our child was about to get hit by the car and you could save him, but you didn't save him, would you be a loving father? And this is what many people feel toward God today. If God were loving and he, and he can save us uh, from suffering, why doesn't he? Okay. But that's, uh, I want you to see that that's foolish thinking because if you're honest with yourself, you have never learned anything or grown in any substantial way except through suffering. Right? So Brian Moore in his book Pulpit and People said, <laughs> this is good. Supposing you eliminated suffering, what a dreadful place the world would be because everything that corrects the tendency of man to feel overimportant or overpleased with himself would disappear. He says man's bad enough now, but he'd be absolutely intolerable if he never suffered. Right? Robert Browning Hamilton, a uh, uh, prolific Victorian era poet, he wrote uh, these two verses. This would be great for you to memorize. He says, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Right? Folks, suffering is the only thing that really matures us in this life, and yet we think about suffering like a man with congestive heart failure, thinks about COVID. Stay away, right? And I think part of this fear of suffering today, uh, I think there is a fear of suffering. We don't like pain, we want, and, and we'll do anything, anything almost, to, uh, uh, to keep from feeling pain. I think part of it is a generational thing. A generation, a gen a generation ago, I think people were more accepting of suffering as a general rule than they are today, okay? Like, consider uh, 
Uh, you know, the, uh, generation ago, people kind of expected suffering as a necessary component to life, but, but today we think of suffering uh, as, as something that hinders life. Okay, so th let's think about kids and bikes today. Okay, we have uh, today we have bicycle safety classes. You hardly ever see a kid riding a bike without a helmet. Some mothers would like to wrap their kids in bubble wrap and then send them out, right, to prevent their kids from getting hurt. But my brothers and I, we had no helmets. No shoes, no shirt, 60 miles an hour down dirt road on a bike with no brakes. <laughs> and if you wanted brakes, you put your shoes on, you stuck your foot in the tire. That's what we did, right? And uh, it <laughs> one of the games we used to play, um, and I, I'm just sure my parents watched us play and, and made fun of us about, and we called it spokes, and here's how it worked. Okay, We took turns. At the time, we lived on a dirt road, and, and, uh, and one kid would stand in the driveway, and the other kid be riding his bike up and down the dirt road, okay, right in front of him. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the, the kid in the driveway would have a stick in his hands or a copper pipe if you could find it, okay. And, 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 and the goal was that as the, as the bicyclist uh, uh, drove by, you'd throw the stick, and the goal was to get it to stick in or go through the spokes of one of the tires. Now, you, but you were aiming for the front tire. Because if you hit the back tire, just skidded to a stop, that was funny. You get in the front tire, he goes flying over the handlebars and lands on his face. <laughs> right? And uh, and I'm just certain my dad was watching us from the house at times saying to mom, honey, watch these two idiots. Right? And we never even considered, you know, what if the copper pipe gained a little more elevation and popped the kid off the side of the head who was not wearing a helmet? You know, a generation ago we thought about suffering differently and we were more... Uh, we were less concerned, but we kind of expected it, okay? But today we feel like there's something wrong with suffering and something wrong with that God would allow us to suffer, okay? But notice that Job does not ask God to remove his suffering, nor does, God accuse, does Job accuse God of wrongdoing by allowing him to suffer. We never hear Job say, God, take this from me. He just wants to know why, okay? Throughout the book of Job, Job has... So he has two concerns in his suffering. We've talked about this. First of all, he wants God to dialogue about him, about his, with him about his suffering. He wants God to tell him what's going on. He wants to know why all of his wealth, health, and family were taken from him all in a matter of two days. He wants dialogue. And the second thing he wants is he wants to be vindicated. Okay? He wants to be, he wants, he wants to speak to God about his ordeal, and he wants to be absolved of his friend's accusations that he's suffering because of his own sins. Job never says, this should not have happened to me, Lord. In fact, he says the opposite. In Job 121, he says, Lord, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay? Job does not think he should not suffer, but he, he, he is not willing to accept the fact that his sins brought his suffering upon him because he knows he walked uprightly with God. So, and, and by the end of the book of Job, Job actually gets both requests answered. Job speaks, uh, God speaks to Job, and God vindicates Job. Okay, in chapter 42, God tells Job's friends that they were wrong about Job, and he tells them to go to Job so that Job can offer sacrifices for them and be forgiven. So Job gets vindicated from his, he gets that request asked. And then God finally speaks to Job too which is what Job has been asking for. Okay? But when God speaks to Job, God does not tell Job what Job most wants to hear. Job wants to know why this has happened to him, but God does not tell him why this has happened to him. And so here's the first thing I want us to see, uh, is that I want us to see how God answers Job. Okay? In chapter 38, verse 1, we didn't read this, but uh, in chapter 38, verse 1, in chapter 40, verse 1, it says, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said. Okay, in these two verses, it's, it's God specifically answering Job. And the word for answered in those verses in the Hebrew is the word ana, which refers to one who is responding to another as in dialogue. Okay, this word ana brings with it the idea of fellowship between two people. This word implies a connection between two parties. And I, I want you to see that when God, quote, answers the other characters in the story, he doesn't answer them in this way. 
in chapters 1 and 2, for example, the Lord also interacts with Satan. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, uh, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? The word said here. Okay, there's an interaction happening, but the word said is the Hebrew word amar, and it's different than the word translated answer in Job 38 and 41. Amar is used more impersonally as a command or a challenge or a statement. The Lord uses the same word, in fact, when he speaks to the three friends in Job 42 that Martha just read. He says in, cha- in, in 42, verse 7, after, after the Lord had spoken these things to Job, he said to Elipaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So that word is the same word. The word said is the same word that God uh, uh, said uh, or, or used rather with Satan. I want you to see this from this. When God finally answers Job, he answers Job differently than anyone else in the story. And here's how we know. In 1 Samuel 28, we have the story of King Saul. Okay? And King Saul was king over Israel at the time, and he had been, he'd been inquiring of the Lord because he was greatly afraid because the Philistines were, uh, had gathered against him. And so Saul desperately wanted an answer uh, from the Lord as to what uh, he should do. But in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 28, it says, When when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. The word answer in 1 Samuel 28 is the same word that God used with Job in Job 38 and Job 41. But here it says God would not answer or interact with Saul that way. And the question is why? Well, Samuel answers that in uh, verse 16. He says, why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? Okay. God would not answer or dialogue with Saul the way he dialogued with Job because Saul was not right with God. Folks, the way God interacts with Job when he finally speaks to Job is the way God interacts with those there is a close connection to. Okay. God speaks to Job in a way a respected friend speaks to another respected friend there's a connection there's a fellowship in fact even though God does not answer Job what God was hoping what Job was hoping God would answer him the way God answers Job shows that God is especially fond of Job okay and so um, and and this is this is the unique fellowship of um, it's a unique fellowship between uh, a believer in Christ and Christ a believer may still suffer many of the things an unbeliever suffers, but a, le- a believer is afforded a fellowship with God in the suffering that an unbeliever does not have. Okay, so this is uh, um, this is how God answers Job. He answers Job like a friend answers a friend, and not impersonally like he does with Satan or uh, the other three friends. The second thing I want us to see is this: I want us to see what God answers Job. Okay. And I want you to see that just because God has a close fellowship with Job does not mean that the answer Job receives is pleasant. Okay. And so in chapter 38, verse 1, it says that the the God answered Job out of the whirlwind or literally out of the storm. In other words, God answered Job with fierceness. And if you read those chapters, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's fierce. Okay. And, and it may have bothered you a bit, actually, in reading 38 through 41, uh, because what we'd like God to say to Job after all that Job has faithfully endured, what we really want God to say, is starting in verse 3, is Job, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? That's what we want God to say. Uh, but instead, God throws Job into a hurricane of his might. <laughs> And, he, and here's the gist of what God says in, in these in 30 through, uh, 38 through 41. He say, God speaks about the logistics of the natural world. Uh, 38 verse 4. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out constellation in its season 
Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? That's a constellation, right? God says, Job, can you rearrange the constellations in the sky? Because I can. Verse 35, do, do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? God says that lightning bolts report to him before they go where they need to go. And God says, do they do that to you? <laughs> right? Chapter 41, verse 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? So Leviathan here refers to either a large sea creature or some, some would say Leviathan uh, refers to a type of dinosaur creature that has since uh, gone extinct. God says, can, can you catch Leviathan, Job? Verse 4, will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? <laughs> or with a leash for your maidens? Verse 8, lay your hand on him, Job. Go ahead. Remember the battle. You'll never forget it. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him, overcoming him is false. No one, so, no one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. And then he says this, who then is able to stand against me? God says, Job, does the Leviathan come and bow down before you and roll over in front of you and whimper at your feet for its daily portion of food? No, it does to me. Okay. And God begins uh, this long discourse uh, uh, on the natural world with a statement. He says, who is this, and Job repeats it in chapter 42, who is this who darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? So the word counsel there is, the wor is a word that means plan. So who is this who darkens my plan without knowledge? God's saying, Job, you've been questioning my plan. You've been questioning how I orchestrate the universe, but you have a major knowledge problem. Who is this who questions my counsel without knowledge, right? And did you know, <coughs> did you know Psalm 147 verse 4 says, God determines the number of stars and calls them by name. And did you know that one galaxy, one galaxy can have up to a trillion stars? And did you know that there are a hundred billion galaxies that are visible to our telescopes? And did you know that from what we can tell that we can only see a minor sliver of the galaxies in the entire universe? And did you know that Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus holds the universe in the palm of his hands and that one day he will roll them up like a robe? Folks, you do not ask a being like this to come into your life to be your assistant. Right? And you know what the problem with so much of the argument that God allows suffering is really that God's not being my assistant. He's not serving me the way I think he should serve me, and I'm mad. Whoa, you got a major knowledge problem, right? That's what God's saying. Did you know uh, the problem with that argument is that it assumes that since our pea brains can't think of a good reason why God would allow suffering into his plan, there can't possibly be a good reason. Since my brain can't fathom it, it's unfathomable. Fa what? Right? God says you have a serious knowledge problem. You darken my counsel without knowledge. If God seems like a fierce storm in these chapters, I want to say he's probably not fierce enough. Right? On the one hand, God welcomes dialogue with his friend Job. He answers him and engages in, in that fellowship. But on the other hand, Job is forgetting the utter unfathomability of the difference <laughs> between him and God. And so Job allows himself to question too much. Now, Job didn't sin by doing this, okay, but he certainly stepped into bigger pants than he was able to wear, okay? And so this is what God answers Job. He answers him unexpectedly and fiercely as out of a storm because Job has forgotten that God can roll the galaxies up as with a robe, and he cannot, okay? So we see how God answers Job. He answers Job in, in this friendship dialogue, okay? We see what God answers Job. He answers Job unexpectedly and with fierceness. Thirdly, we see this. What God does not answer 
Job. So Job has wanted to know from day one, we said, uh, why this is happening to him, and God no, never told him why. You know, every bone in Job's body wants an answer, right? But here's what I want to show you. I want to show you that God can't show Job the reason why and prove the devil false at the same time. God can't show Job the answer why and prove the devil false at the same time. The, the, the accusation that Satan used was this. Remember, he said, Job only loves you because you protect him from harm and provide him everything he has. That's the accusation. Job's a fraud. He serves you, but not for you. He serves you for himself. So why can't God tell Job why? Anybody seen the Truman Show? 1998 film. Uh, American psychological comedy drama starring, and the main star is Truman Burbank, and he's the unsuspecting star of the show. And so the Truman Show is is uh, a movie about a, a reality television program filmed 24-7 through thousands of hidden cameras and broadcast to a worldwide audience, okay? And so Kristoff, the show's creator and executive producer, he seeks to capture Truman, Truman Burbank, the, the character, uh, authentic emotions and gives um, and, and give audiences a relatable everyday man by having him born into this fake world and doing all he can to make Truman believe it is the real world. Okay, you see, Truman's ho hometown is uh, a town called Sea Haven Island, and the town is a complete set built within an enormous dome populated by crew members and actors. And the elaborate set allows Kristoff to control almost every aspect of Truman's life, including the weather. And so to prevent Truman from discovering that he's in a false world, uh, Kristoff manufactures scenarios that dissuade Truman, uh, uh, dissuades Truman, Truman's desires for exploration, such as uh, the death of his father in a sea storm to instill aquaphobia in Truman so that Truman himself won't try to leave the island. Does that make sense? And so, uh, when, when, so when I watched this movie, I was struck by a couple things. First of all, I was struck by what it would be like to have everything in your world revolve around you. And I watched this in my early 20s. And I'm like, wouldn't that be great? You know, I think the world revolves around me anyway. And so, you know, what would it be like? Okay. This, but the second thing that struck me was this: how how long-term hurtful it would be to Truman when he finally discovered that everything and everyone in his life was lying to him. Everyone in his life was only pretending to be themselves, when in reality, everyone was an actor in his life except himself. And I thought how hurtful that would be when he finally found out. Okay, but you see, the only way for the show to remain popular was if Truman actually believed he was in reality. Because the second Truman discovered that his world was not reality but a giant TV set was the second the show would stop being a reality show because Truman's actions would stop being authentic. Right? And I want you to remember that the accusation, the, the accusation against uh, Job by Satan was that Job was a fake. And imagine for a moment if God were to say to Job before his suffering, Job, I'm about to agree with a deal with the devil. That he will take everything from you. Now this is only a test. After the devil has taken everything from you and you've maintained your faith in me through it all, I will at that point restore everything to you, double what you now have. If God were to have had that, uh, uh, were to have given Job a heads up, okay, that would certainly have made Job's suffering a lot more bearable, would it not? But... If God were to tell Job that before or even during Job's suffering, the show would be over. Why? Because if Job knew this was only a test, and if he knew that after the test he would get double what he started with, Satan could reaccuse Job at that point by saying, well, since you told him you, uh, what was going on, he's only serving you now because you promised him double. Okay? Therefore, the only way for Job's faith to be proven to us and to the devil that it is authentic if we're Job were, if we're Job were never allowed to see the play right. 
And so part of us feels grateful that Job is for us an authentic person of faith who served God for God and not for what God gave him. But part of us feels bad for Job, too, because we were told about what was going on. Chapter 1, we get the the devil-God interaction. Job never gets that. Now, folks, I don't believe that God is in the habit of making playwrights with the devil to somehow put our life on show in order to prove to the devil the authenticity of our faith. I don't think that's how God interacts with me. I think that's Job's scenario. But I, d- it was, but I do believe that unless God withholds from us the reasons for our own suffering, we will not be convinced that our own faith is authentic. Because if you never suffer in this life, how will you know? if your faith is authentic. Lord, do I serve you because you give me stuff? I don't know, because you've always given me stuff. Right? But let suffering come into your life without any explanation from God, and the true condition of your faith will show you. Right? In this way, folks, it is often true that God's blessings are not safe for us until we have shown that we are ready to serve God without them. So we see how God answers Job. We see what God answers Job. We see what God does not answer Job. God does not answer Job. Why? He never reveals to Job the reason because he can't reveal to Job the reason and the point be made. And the last thing we see is this. What, what, what's the answer? What's the answer? In uh, chapter 40, verse 8, in this fierce dialogue that God had with Job, the Lord said, Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? And the point in the immediate context is this. Job, it is ridiculous to think that you know better how to run this world or judge this world than I do. Do you really think that I can be proven wrong so that you can be proven right? I will one day roll up this universe as a robe, and you are just a speck in that robe. So that's the immediate context meaning of the verse. Job, are you really trying to say that you're right and I'm wrong, okay? Um, but but here's, here's what this point, uh, here, here's <coughs> what this points to that Job never saw. The, the only way for the fierce whirlwind of God's might to be tamed for us so that God can answer us as he would answer a friend is for God to be content, condemned so we can be justified. The only way, let me find my spot, for the fierce whirlwind of God's might to be tamed for us so that, God's, uh, so that God can answer us as he would answer a friend is for God to be content, condemned so that we can be justified. For every one of us standing by ourselves, folks, the devil's accusations are true, right? When the devil says, this person has sinned, Lord, they're selfish. They're self-seeking. They've wanted to do good, but they did the wrong instead. (laughs) They justified themselves. They put down others. They lied. They cheated. They stole. They've actually thought they could run this world better than you. These people deserve to be cast out of your presence and experience the fierce whirlwind of your wrath. Standing by ourselves, the devil's accusations are absolutely true, and there's not enough do-gooding we can do to make them untrue. As the governor of the entire universe, God's perfect justice must be satisfied, and we can't satisfy it. But just as God's fierceness is more than we can imagine, so God's love is more than we can imagine. And God loves us so much that he will cross the universe to save us. Should God be condemned so we can be justified? That's the most ridiculous proposition in the world. Should God become our servant? That's preposterous. Should the one who will one day roll up the stars like a robe somehow be condemned by the creatures he made? There is perhaps nothing more ludicrous than that thought. But on the cross, that's what happened. On the cross, Jesus was condemned that we could be justified. On the cross, Jesus received our full condemnation so that we could receive his full Except we see on the cross the fierceness of God that sin has to be judged and cruelly. At the same time on the cross we see the amazing love of God. That God crossed the universe to put himself there. 
And when you see that the creator of billions of galaxies made his way to our puny planet <laughs> to give his life so that we could live, you will stop asking questions. You'll stop asking why. You will stop questioning him. You'll stop doubting him. You'll stop imagining that you will be a better president of the universe than he is. You will stop needing answers to all of your many questions, and you will learn to simply trust the one who traveled galaxies to save you. And this is what happened to Job. Job 42, verse 5, Job said, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you, so I will shut up <laughs> and repent in dust and ashes. Job said, now that I've seen you, Lord, for who you are and all you are, I have no more questions. My questions are finished. It's no, it no longer matters to me what the question is. There is no question that I could ever have from here on out for which I do not find its answer in Christ. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for us, you will stop asking questions and will say, I, Lord, I've heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you, and you are enough. You're enough for me in suffering. You're enough for me in plenty. You're enough for me when I have everything I need, and you're enough for me when I have nothing. When you look directly into the face of Jesus, you don't have any more questions you need answered. He is the answer. And so as we prepare to surround communion again today, let me ask you, have you thought that since you could not figure a reason for your suffering, there must not be one? Have you feared suffering instead of seeing that no one ever really changed except through it? Have you made most of your prayers about God removing your suffering instead of about trusting him more completely through it? Have you forgotten that you are the creature and he is the creator. Have you questioned him too much? Have you tried to wear pants that are far too big for you to wear? Have you spent more time questioning God's competency than questioning your own? Do you really think you know more than God? Do you really think any of what you know holds up to what God knows? Do you see that you have a serious knowledge problem? Do you see how much you need suffering in your life? You need it to grow and you need it to test the authenticity of your own faith. Do you still have questions about suffering because you spent too much time looking at your pain and not enough time looking at the Savior on the cross? You boast that you know of God, but your questions confess you've not yet really seen him. Is he enough for you? Are all of your questions proven irrelevant and unimportant? When you look at Jesus, do you have a relationship with God yet for which God can answer you with Anna instead of Amar? Or will he speak to you like Job's friends because your sin remains? If you've not surrendered your life to Jesus yet, confess your belief in him and begun your walk with him through that act of baptism. I want to say God can't speak to you as a friend yet. He wants to, but your sins remain and he can't. You need Jesus because Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Jesus was the God-man. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father, but you cannot go to the Father unless you've surrendered to Jesus. And so maybe that's your next step today. What is your next step today? As the music plays, we're going to form two lines, and we're going to come and receive our communion emblems, and we'll bring those back to our seat unless it's appropriate for you to spend some time at the front kneeling praying. If you need to be prayed for, if you see a next step or you need some help in doing it, I want you to come to me. I'll be over here to the right. Maureen will be over here to the left. What is your next step of faith today? Let's stand and commune together. <laughs>